When people think of Werner Herzog's documentaries, it's probably his distinct voice and the poetry in which he expresses himself that comes to mind first. But there's something else about his work that has really struck me too. And that's how Herzog exploits the power of silence. In his more recent films, he often introduces characters by making them face camera without saying a word. He also creates these long pauses that lets the audience have more time to absorb what we've been told. But there are two other facets to his use of silence which I find even more powerful. One being the moments where Herzog forces the people he's interviewing to really feel the silence. It's as if he's deliberately not talking to them when they expect him to. It results in these strange but very human micro moments that can be just as illuminating as speech. The other facet has to do with how independent scenes are tied together. To demonstrate what I mean, we'll look at a range of his documentaries including the 2016 film Lo and Behold. That will reveal how you can make Elon Musk look like a fool with a single edit and a moment of silence, which I'll get to at the end. Now let's get started. First, let's look at his earlier films. Here you'll notice that silence is not as prominent. This is footage from his 1974 film about a Swiss ski jumper, the great ecstasy of woodcarver Steiner. In the following, notice the timing in Herzog's editing. When I nicht mehr gesprungen wäre, then glaube ich hätte ich so eine Angst bekommen oder respektive einen Respekt vor dem Skispringen, vor dem Skiflegen. Und sobald ich wieder einen Sprung gleich danach gestanden habe und weiß, es geht, das ist für mich die Rettung gewesen. Steiner finishes talking and the cut comes right away. The same often happens in the next two examples from the late 90s. Both are really engrossing films where the subjects speak like rapid fire machine guns. This is from Wings of Hope, about a young biologist who survived falling out of an airplane in Peru. Und ich dachte, das ist die Rettung, denn dort, wo diese Vögel sind, da muss ein größeres Gewässer sein. Ich habe die Richtung geändert und bin schnurstracks auf diese Stimmen zu marschiert, denn ich hoffte, dass ich dort Menschen finden würde. Similar pacing in the editing exists in Little Dieter Needs to Fly, featuring a pilot who escaped a prison camp in Vietnam. Herzog has called him one of the greatest rappers of all time. Fly the airplane and glide it right over this ridge. There was a ridge on the right hand side. There was a lot of trees, as I said. There was a, uh, uh, an enormous tree in front of me. And just before I hit it, I kicked full right rudder. The airplane yaw to the right. There was an impact on the left wing. It snapped this, this, this thick tree off. And of course, the, then the left wing went back. Then the entire tail, the rudder, horizontal stabilizer, everything just tumbled by. I clearly remember the canopy start cracking in the lower left hand corner. Just like slow motion, it was cracking, it ripped off, then my helmet was just jerked off my head, and then the airplane started to cartwheel. And I know it's hard to get a complete picture from these snippets, and there are minor exceptions, but I'd say this pacing is a tendency in Herzog's work before the turn of the century. I'm not arguing this way of doing it is wrong, but I think part of his path as a documentarian has been one of finding moments of silence more often. To me, that's one major reason as to why his films feel so different. Look at the change of tone in the following. This is from his series On Death Row from 2012. Herzog is talking to a former friend of a bodybuilder who is waiting to be executed. Notice the delayed cut and the atmosphere it creates when combined with music. And you are not easily scared? No. You are strong? I am strong. Confident? Yes. Principled? Yes. That saved you? Yeah. That made the difference? True. The subject's silence lasts for exactly 20 seconds. And here's the same technique in use, this time in Grizzly Man, where Herzog speaks to a morticianer who examined Timothy Treadwell, who had been eaten. Amy, we know, fought back for approximately six minutes 
Amy stayed with her lover, with her partner, with her mate, and with the bear. Ultimately, she stayed with the bear in the situation. Both body language and his eyes reveal he's confused or unsure about what's happening. It's as if Herzog is deliberately leaving his subjects hanging. In my view, this is more than just a pause for us to catch our breath. It feels like Herzog is creating a form of liminal time. It's an in-between state. And when he uses it, awkwardness serves to reveal something different, often creating moments that are unique to Herzog's films. Take this interview with a plumber, for example. It's from the film Encounters at the End of the World. He tells us his hands point to a special lineage. And I was told by my doctor who operated me that it is from the Aztec and the Incas royal family. And I can turn it around too if you want to see it this way. It's very distinct, the line here. And, and now, when brief silence occurs, look what that gives us. It's so hard for a small minority to make it, but, uh, en el nombre de Dios, buenos días les de Dios. Without being asked about it, he holds up his hands again. It's as if he feels the need to fill the awkward silence with something. This is even more illuminating in another Herzog favorite of mine, the white diamond. You can do it whenever you want. You just have to have that dream. Just and then just zoom up. That's the thing. We should let's go fly. Let's go fly. <laughs> this man is an engineer who lost a close friend in an airship accident years earlier. Again. Notice his eyes and how silence pushes him to keep talking and become more personal. When you get a bit of peace and quiet, just just quiet, then you have a chance to think. Just quietly floating above the forest in those mists. Of course, in a way, there's always going to be this at uh, the same time, in this lightness, in this kind of ethereal theory, feeling of floating and in this mist. That'll be beautiful, but at the same time, my mind will always have this heaviness in it. It's not just the danger, it's the, it's that feeling of, 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 of danger that the thing could go wrong, but it's, it's, it's still the past. And, uh, I'm hoping that this project will finally, I don't know, at least prove that what we did way back in Sumatra was right and that, um, that, that Dieter Plug's vision was um, justified. In my life, I've only met a few men who've impressed me. Now, the following examples are even more powerful but this time it has to do with the overarching structure of several scenes. We'll get on to the Elon Musk example in a second, but first I have one more from Grizzly Man. Here we have Herzog listening to the audio tape from the moment Treadwell and his girlfriend was killed. I hear rain and I hear Amy, get away, get away, go away. You must never listen to this. I know, Werner. I'm never going to. And you must never look at the photos that I've seen at the coroner's office. I will never look at them. Yeah. But now, look at the footage Herzog chooses to cut to. Out of all the options he's got in terms of placement for this scene, why put it here? Treadwell's camera was recording while he was killed, but with the lens cap on. 
even if it was off, we probably wouldn't even want to see any of the footage. So instead, Herzog gives us a substitute through this fight scene. He's telling us, in ponderous detail, that these are the brutal forces which Treadwell and his girlfriend was exposed to. It's as if we're watching them being attacked vicariously. But Herzog, known for his voiceover, chooses to stay silent, letting the placement of the footage speak for itself. There's a somewhat similar dynamic in the upcoming example too. This is from Lo and Behold, a film about the impact of AI, robots and the internet. We're about to hear from Elon Musk, but first we need to see what Herzog chooses to precede him. It's an interview with an astronomer. Listen, then notice the long pause when we've cut to Elon. You know, while I would like us to explore Mars more, I think the only thing that we've demonstrated is that we're very good at destroying the habitability of Earth, um, rather than improving the habitability of a completely alien world. The idea that Mars will somehow save us from the decisions we've made here is a false one. And um, it's a little like saying that you're going to go live in the lifeboat when, you know, even lifeboats need somewhere to land. I don't think I have good dreams, honestly. Oh, I'm sure I have good dreams sometimes, but I don't seem to remember the good dreams. Uh, As you can hear, he's replying to a question about his dreams. But I'd argue that the pause is what's important to Herzog here. It is, of course, a statement on the foolishness of Elon Musk's dreams about colonizing Mars. But again, it's being said with silence. And if there was any doubt about Herzog's intentions here, we can listen to the man himself speaking about Elon at a live event. To have, and he speaks about up to a million people, getting 100 people there, you have to shoot rapid fire, machine gun fire of rockets to Mars. Every 30 second one with uh, hundreds of robots, which will build, let's say, a cupola. And, and then hundreds of more of rockets, rapid fire, that bring up water that bring up uh, air for breathing. So it will be so phenomenally costly and so complex that it's not gonna happen. We may land a single astronaut or two of them in, in, in a little toilet box in a phone booth <laughs> on there and they will be miserable for three days and return. And with that, I'll leave you to consider Werner Herzog's use of silence yourself for the next time you watch one of his documentaries. Enjoy. Silence, please. Please don't move. We're going to listen to the silence in the cave. And perhaps we can even hear our own heartbeats. <laughs> 